Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is David J. Peterson. He's what is known as a co-langer. That is a creator of languages. He's plied his trade on Game of Thrones, where he created both the spoken and written forms of Dothraki, High Valerian, Astapori Valerian, and Magnuk. That's right, even the writing, from handwritten notes to graffiti on the walls in the background, everything is in the appropriate language, and those languages are all created by David. He also created languages for shows like Defiance, Dominion, Starcrossed, The 100, Penny Dreadful, and Marvel's feature film Thor The Dark World. You can catch up with him on theartoflanguageinvention.com, but today in celebration of the climactic conclusion of Game of Thrones, you can catch him on the Break It Down show. Here's our special guest, David J. Peterson. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitch Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Meto Maroon. This is David Peterson, and this is The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Was that Valerian or is that that one, that one was Dothraki? So if you, okay, so it's easier to say hello in Dothraki, at least for me, than Valerian. Valerian, it's Kritsas. If you guys haven't figured it out or not yet, uh, David Peterson is here with us, and he is the guy responsible for the languages, among other places, but it's primarily uh, Game of Thrones because that's super topical right now, and not just Valerian and Dothraki, but there's an entire like. Indo-European language chart of languages that you've got for this world. Yeah, yeah. It would, in fact, it would have been nicer if I could flesh out more of the languages. That would be a really, really cool project. But of course, you know, for the show, they only wanted to focus on the ones that, you know, played into the actual drama. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like the High Valyrian language in particular has, um, is a language that gave birth to uh, seven, eight, or nine other languages. We had to see one of one other one in the show, and then two different dialects of it. But there are tons of others: Bravosi, Pentoshi, Mirish language. All of those are full languages, or could be full languages in the universe. I'd love to do them one day. I just need to have an excuse to do so. Do the writers of the of the shows know that? all that stuff exists or is that only like oh i'm ready whenever they're ready oh yeah they know it exists okay. but it's like we didn't you know we didn't really spend any time in volantis we didn't any spend like any time in pentos so you know it just wouldn't make sense to create these right. full languages when there's literally no drama there and, and nobody speaking the languages but you still have to be prepared to deal with that though if they say hey we're going to go to pentos this season or maybe going to go to pentos this season You've got to still do the work in advance, right? Yeah, just as long as they give me some lead time, yeah, uh, I'll be able to do that. I mean, that's certainly what I did for for Valerian, um, and then for Miranese when they needed it the next day. What what does season. the lead time look like? Um, for Game of Thrones, the lead time is pretty good. I usually had anywhere between three months to six, seven months. Um, it was unlike any other television show that I've worked on. Uh, just they gave. They gave everybody, you know, the actors and me, they gave everybody a ton of time to prepare. I mean, th and I'm talking about like between three and seven months mm. before the beginning of principal photography, not necessarily uh, before my scene shoots. Mm. Like that's scene one. My scene could be shooting like two, three months after the beginning of principal photography. It's tons of time. With other shows, like it's literally like, okay, this is two weeks until the scene actually shoots. So... You know, can you create an entire language and then translate dialogue into us for us? And as soon as possible so the actors can learn it. <laughs> yeah, but is that is that a reasonable request? I mean, obviously you can get it done. Okay. No, it's not. What, what's, what's the minimum reasonable request? Obviously there's get it done stuff, but... Three months. Three months, okay. Three months is, is minimum reasonable. It's still not the, still not the best, okay. the best amount of time. I would like more time than that. I mean, to create a full language and really get it set, you need about a year, but you rarely get that kind of lead time. Yeah. And then the other question is, is you were, I was listening to some of the other, you've done a ton of interviews. Everybody should go listen to that stuff. We'll try to cover new ground, but you talked about how there's about, at least in this one, about 5,000 words in Valerian that are already developed. Is there like a, um, 
it's like a rule of thumb, like for every word of, of dialogue, I'm going to need, say, 15 other words created just to kind of properly, you know, because you can't just make up a word. It, it's got a path. It's got, you know, there's roots and there's prefixes and suffixes. Yeah, um, it's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. I mean, certainly if you want to translate a full sentence, you need the entire grammar to support it. Because it's not as if, you know, you know, this particular sentence may use one tense, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not as if, oh, okay, I created that one tense, and if I need another tense, I'll create another. And it's like, no, these, um, you know, something like verbal tense, it's a system. Yeah. It's a full system, and so the full system needs to be built to use any of it. Uh, when it comes to words, you know, every so often you'll need a word, and it will just be that one word, and it won't have much of a history, and so you create it and you're done. Most of the time, though, words, uh, you know, derive from other sources. And so you'll need those sources to derive the word from. And then the word itself will be a part of a relationship and network of other meanings for various words. And so, um, you know, usually I go through the process of creating those because they'll end up being useful later on. Honestly, the more vocabulary you have ahead of time before translation is needed, the better off you are because then you're not stuck at any point saying, oh, I need a bunch of words and I've only got an hour because this stuff takes time. When you look at parts of speech and then different, you know, structures like the verb always modifies the noun, it goes first in the sentence or it goes the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Are you trying just to build something that's simple and effective or like the easiest way is to go, you know, verb, noun, predicate or whatever it's going to be? No, there isn't really an easy way. Yeah. I mean, there's... Easier depending on your linguistic background. So it's like um, English speakers will have an easier time learning and using uh, head initial Mm -hmm. structures. That is, you know, expecting objects to come after verbs, expecting prepositions, expecting relative clauses to come after the nouns that they modify. Um, Those aren't easier. They're Mm -hmm. easier for English speakers. Right. They would you know, probably be more difficult for speakers of Japanese or Turkish who would be used to things happening the other way. Right. Um, so there's uh, so there's no real you know easy or hard. There's just relatively easy or relatively difficult. In terms of complexity, all languages are equally complex. Hmm. The question is where does that complexity sit? So it's like all right, this language has only two verb tenses. Great. So then you only have to learn those two. But then how do you say all the other stuff? Mm-hmm. Uh, you still have to figure out some way to say it. So like in Spanish, you know, like there's two uh, tenses in the past tense. There's a, a present tense, right? There's two different types of future tenses. Um, there's a bunch of like composite. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's one composite future tense and a non-composite future tense. And then there's two different subjunctive tenses and all this stuff goes on. And so that's a ton of stuff to learn. English, by comparison, is, is simpler. Mm-hmm. But... What that means is when you learn English, it's like, okay, well, how do you say all that other stuff? It's like, okay, well, then if you wanted to say this that you could do with one word in Spanish, you could say, you know, um, I would have had to have been eating that. And it's like, okay, <laughs> how do you learn to do that? Yeah. I mean, it's a bunch of words. How yeah. do you learn that? It's like, it's not like it's easier. It's just different. The complexity is there. It's just different. And it's a, just, I guess, a matter of preference or your linguistic background, which one you find easier, memorizing a bunch of different verb tenses or memorizing a whole bunch of different auxiliaries and exactly how they fit together and what it means. Mm. Yeah, and for me, whenever, whenever I'm dealing with language, it's, I've always had like immersion as a benefit. I'm not very good at any of them, but I, I'm like Chewbacca. I can listen. I can nod my head and make some sounds. <laughs> you know, I have a large vocabulary for listening, but not, not going out the other direction. Sa- same thing must apply, though, for these actors as they try to do it, because they don't, you're not actually in Valeria or in, you know, with a Dothraki tribe, you know, being a, a, on the road with those guys. So, but yet it seems like they have a really a command of the language. I mean, obviously they're acting, but I think there's more to it than that. Well, maybe. I mean, the thing is, I, uh, you know, I record every single line and Mm -hmm. I record it exactly the way it's supposed to be said. Most of the time, they're just listening and repeating exactly that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Every so often, there will be a more challenging task for them. That was certainly the case in season three and then a little bit in season four, but especially season three. When Natalie Emanuel plays uh, Miss Sandy, had to work with uh, Dan Hildebrand, who played Krasny's, because she was a translator, 
And so um, it's funny because her lines were in English, so you'd think they w- wouldn't be tough or wouldn't be, you know, you know, challenging language-wise. But the thing was, when they had me translate his stuff, it was just like, here's a big block of text. Um, here's his speech translated. So I'm like, all right, whatever I translate, I give it back to him and he learns it. But the thing is, then she had to act like she was listening to what he said sure. and translated it in English. She just yeah. had her English lines. So they had to work together and figure that out and say, all right, this is how long it takes me to say this. This is what I have said at this point. And so it would be appropriate for you to start speaking the English at this point. Mm-hmm. Because like if they didn't get that timing right, yeah. she starts translating in English before he's even said it. Yeah. Right? So I didn't, it's the funny thing is I didn't think about that. I bet the writers didn't think about it, but I didn't think about it because, you know, they just gave me the stuff to translate. Sure. I didn't even look at her English lines, to be honest. That was just on them yeah. working together to make it look like she was actually translating what he said. And they did an incredible job. Yeah. I've worked with an interpreter quite a bit, but I, years and years. And you're right. It never even occurred to me that, that they were acting that part up, but they absolutely are. There's the timing there. And then also the way that she, you know, translated what was actually being said to what needed to be said to, mm-hmm. to the party. Yeah. And but, reacting, right. right? Reacting yeah. to what she knew he was saying, but then changing it to her actual line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's super clever. I'm, I'm assuming that everybody's pretty familiar with Game of Thrones. And if not, um, you guys should watch it. It's fantastic. So let, let's back out and go back and you've got two degrees in linguistics and a degree in English, all from UCs. So you're not playing around. You know what you're doing. When did, give us an idea, like, has language always fascinated you, or did you just kind of fall into it once you got to school? Give us some of the background. Yeah, I didn't really much care for language growing up at all. Um, I grew up in a house where uh, Spanish was common. My, my mother's family is all from Mexico, and so I grew up with Spanish, but I was kind of separated from it. Uh, at a critical stage, so around four or five years old, maybe a little bit younger than that. And so I stopped getting Spanish input mm-hmm. and I basically killed whatever chance I had of being bilingual. It was just done at that point. Um, anyway, so uh, when, I, when we reunited with our family, uh, after my mother divorced her first uh, 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 second husband, Suddenly, you know, all I had all these relatives speaking Spanish, and I just couldn't understand anything anymore. Yeah. It was all too quick. It was just way too much for me. And so I kind of uh, rebelled against it. Said, like, ah, oh, I hate it when people speak other languages. It's so difficult. Yeah. And so, like, when I got to high school, I just took Spanish because it was the easy route. And then just suddenly, when I was 17, uh, just one day, I just all of a sudden decided I was crazy interested in language. I wanted to learn French, and then I wanted to learn every language on the planet. And so I started just studying any language that Mm -hmm. I could get a hold of, anything. We had a Latin book at home. I started studying that. A friend of mine lent me a French book. My senior year, I started taking taking German in high school, uh, which was German one while I was taking AP Spanish. Uh, and then when I got to Berkeley, you know, I kept on studying as many languages as I could get. Um, but I don't have a, I don't have a really great explanation for why I just suddenly decided that I was super interested in learning languages. It literally just happened one day, like one specific day I woke up Yeah. and that was what I decided. Any idea, like any clarity on that day on you woke up, had coffee and went, oh, you know what? I love this. Actually, it was. I woke up from a dream, and I'm somebody that has a very difficult time waking up. Mm. But no, I woke up from a dream, and I was very, very frustrated, very frustrated and upset that millions of people spoke French and I wasn't one of them. I really felt like I was missing out. Yeah, yeah. And that was that was part of what drove me. Yeah, I mean. I don't know why, I don't know why French, I mean, it always kind of, everybody's always kind of interested in French for any, for reasons that Americans always would be, but I don't know, like, I felt like, especially at that moment, like my window had closed, Mm. like I'd had the opportunity to take French as a freshman, but I took Spanish instead, and I was like, oh, crap. Uh, But it was, it really wasn't long after that that I made the jump to, wait a minute, why just French? There's millions of people that speak millions of languages. Yeah. Why, Why shouldn't I learn them all? So, 
And then obviously you have a, uh, an affinity and, and likely some kind of proclivity for language structure, but are you one of those people that you just wash the language over them and they pick it up? I, my time in the military, there's people like they speak 15 languages because once you get past a certain point, it's, you're just reassembling what you already know in a lot of ways. Is that, do you have that capability at all? Or? I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, it's okay, I guess. Um, no, I, I don't think I'm certainly as good as as others that really just jump in there. I think I'm better the less familiarity I have with the language. Mm-hmm. Um, the more familiarity I have, the more I feel like I should be doing it correctly. And that mm-hmm. can really be an inhibiting factor. Yeah. If you ever find those people that are really good at speaking languages, you'll discover that they really don't care if they make a mistake. And they do make mistakes for a little while, Yeah. Uh, just like everybody does. But I think the difference is they just run right over them. Yeah. They're just like they don't care. And if somebody points it out, they say, all right, and then I'll, I'll do it differently next time. Um, I think a, a, lot of, a lot of problems that occur with language learning can really be attributed to just inhibition. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I was working on Arabic, and again, I'm terrible at it, but uh, one of the things that really unlocked a lot of it for me was the, the teacher's like, the vowels don't matter in Arabic. Mm-hmm. Whatever vowel you want, write whatever vowel you want in there. Who cares? <laughs> it's all the consonants and and you know the other aspects of the language, and that took a lot of the took a whole lot of the fear away because I'm like, oh, it, it, I can say Muhammad however I really want because the vowels don't really matter that much. Yeah, you just hit the big ones, the long ones, right? right? You know, the yeah. other, the other ones like you know, hash and it's like it doesn't matter what the <laughs> the little ones were. <laughs> It's really funny, though, um, this is kind of uh, going a little bit far afield, but when, um, you know, that uh, many languages are written with a writing system that was developed for some other language. You know, Mm -hmm. English is one of those. Our writing system was developed for Latin, um, but we use it for English. Um, And the Roman alphabet is one of the big ones. Some Mm -hmm. of the other big ones are, you know, Cyrillic, um, Chinese characters, and, of course, the Arabic script. And the Arabic script was... uh, you know, used for languages like uh, Farsi and Turkish, where indeed, as you point out, in Arabic, yeah, the the non-long vowels are not really important. Right. You just can kind of do whatever you want. You can write them or not write them. Then you go to languages like Farsi and Turkish. Yeah. The vowels are vitally important. Right. <laughs> vitally important. They are crucial. And it's just so funny to see, uh, uh, you know, this Arabic writing system which is, again, not suppo- you're not supposed to care about the vowels, and you're trying to write this language where vowels are important with yeah. this writing system, and it's just as a mess. <laughs> it's like, who thought this was a good idea? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I guess, so this is kind of a funny thing. When I was getting my undergrad degree, I realized pretty late that there was a foreign language requirement, mm-hmm. and I had a great counselor who's like, well, just take English. And so <laughs> I did. I took, like... You know, the required number of uh, quarters of English. But it, they were the hardest English classes I took. Some of the hardest I took in all of college. You, you learned about, like, our our disregard for vowels. Like, any vowel can make any sound. And, you know, just all of these things. And there's no umlauts. There's no help. You just, you know, someone learning language, you have to just come across that, you know, I-E and E-I, same sound. And maybe totally different sounds and different words. <laughs> that stuff always it's always fascinated me. And then also the um, we started like in this class. It was an etymology based class, but we started in English and worked our way back up the uh, Indo European chart, like into High German. I'm like I'm reading and kind of understanding High German all of a sudden, like within you know two class hours. It was incredible to once you had a guide to show you. None of that sticks. But you are like, it's like you're on a tour of high German or something. You know, if it weren't for the Norman conquest, we'd have a lot easier time learning languages like German and Dutch. Uh, the problem is that anytime you get to you know, a longer word or, you know, a more complicated word in English, it comes from Latin, mm. either directly from Latin or from Latin through French. Um, and so it's weird. It's like looking at a Germanic language, but taking all of the big words and just totally replacing them with words from some other language. Yeah. And so it's like if you if you look at German or you hear German, you can understand it until the vocabulary starts getting complex. And then it's like, well, I don't know what that was. <laughs> and yeah. yet we have words like 
inclination and you know oh my gosh you know there's just tons of words like that that all just were borrowed wholesale from latin and, and it's it's the it's the thing that just makes it so impossible for us to connect to the languages yeah. that we're actually more closely related to i like when i find words that that are just puzzling like um i've never been buked but I've been rebuked, you know, mm. um, I've never mained, but I do remain, you know, and it's just all these things where like the, the prefix doesn't, doesn't jive with like the, the root word, you know, those things are just funny things in language that you find like that. You're like that. We just, you just learn them. You don't, there's no rhyme or reason to it, you know? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, and the reason it's just in history, we found use for one word, one derivation of one right. word, and not really for any others. And so if nobody uses it, then it's just invisible. It's gone. I realized the other day that uh, grace is the only word I could think of that has full and us at the end of it. You know, like if you're um, on a laborious, you don't say laborful, you know, so it has you have both Gracious. of those. Oh, now you're going to make me, now you're going to make me think about that. <laughs> Well, don't get too distracted by it. But those those things fascinate me. So I have a little bit of, of what you've got. Um, but I want to get back into the Game of Thrones stuff. And, and I don't want to undersell what you did because there's so much work that you've done. But this is the most current thing we can wrap our hands around. As Are you coaching the actors? You know, like Peter Dinklage has to say, I have really bad Valerian, so I'm going to try to speak. He has to actually act like that. Oh, yeah. No, it's just uh, it's just the audio files. I mean, I say them exactly how they're supposed to be said, including including Tyrion's, you know, poorly formed mm -hmm. uh, Valyrian, uh, including, you know, Daenerys's um, foreign accented Dothraki uh, versus her native accented High Valyrian. I just record everything. And so... Are you putting in the incorrect words? That... Yeah. Okay. 100%. Wow. Yeah. Because, of course, you can't just do the incorrections randomly. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the incorrect versions have to make sense. You know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, um, I always enjoyed during doing those for Tyrion and it was fun doing those for Daenerys at the beginning when she was learning death Rocky. It's always, it's always fun doing stuff like that. Yeah. And so is it stuff like Chavot and Chavot where like it's, you know, same kind of word and it's a rookie mistake to mix them up or, you know, any of those things like in Spanish where you can say the same word slightly differently. Well, there's two different types of errors there. One is just, you know, forgetting a word and replacing it with a similar sounding word. Mm -hmm. You know, that'll happen no matter what the language. But then there's others where you make mistakes based on, based on your language background. Mm. So it's like, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, like, for example, somebody who comes from uh, India might say, you know, uh, I am seeing him yesterday because of the constructions that are used in Hindi. And also it's just acceptable in Indian English. Mm -hmm. um, but you wouldn't expect somebody whose first language was Spanish to ever make a mistake like that. That's not the type of mistakes that they make mm -hmm. because, I mean, Spanish doesn't, you don't say something like that in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And usually the mistakes, the type of mistakes that are made are people directly translating their native language into the language that they're learning mm, that and it doesn't sense. translate. And so, um, and so when I do that, like that's, that's what you have to do is say, okay, this is somebody coming from English mm -hmm. who's trying to speak Valerian. And so they make very specific types of errors in terms of word order. And then also just predictable types of errors, like, you know, messing up, um, uh, messing up verb conjugations and things like that. So, you know, that, and that type of thing, like saying, you know, you know, you know, um, uh, he see a cat versus he sees a cat. Um, that's the type of thing. Yeah. 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 When, so is this all you do now is the language creation thing? Yep. When did you realize that was a reality? Uh, I mean, we pretended it was a reality for the first couple of years working on Game of Thrones, even yeah. though I wasn't getting paid nothing. But, uh, once I started working on Defiance and mm -hmm. then, um, and then Starcrossed, when I had a couple of extra shows that I was working on, that was when I realized that I was actually earning uh, decent money doing this just full time, as opposed to, you know, kind of bare minimum. And then really since, probably since, you know, Defiance, I've been pretty consistently employed mm -hmm. ever since, uh, sometimes radically overemployed. That's the case right now. But the great thing is that now that... Um, 
now that I have my literary agent working for me and working out these deals, I'm able to work with other language creators, which both uh, makes things easier for me and also gives other language creators an opportunity to actually do this work and get recognized. So I'm really, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, what a neat thing to do to take something that didn't exist. I don't know what, 25 years ago, there was really no community of people that did this professionally, I'm assuming. Mm. I mean, people, someone invented Klingon yep. and that group. But I mean, that, other than that, I can't think of other examples of, of this kind of work. Yeah, there were, there were other, I mean, there were other examples. The first one that we know of is actually Land of the Lost. Do you remember that show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the television show. Yeah. I used to watch it as a kid. I yeah. had no idea there was a language in it. Turns out there was. It was the Pakuni language. They yeah. actually hired somebody to create that language huh. for that show. Yeah. Of all uh, shows. Seriously. Demetra Don breathing fire, and they're like, you know what? We need a real language. Is that Sid and Marty Croft? People. I think it is, right? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Of all shows, yeah. So that's, as far as we know, the first time in history somebody was paid to create a language. But even that's Rompkin. not even 50 years ago. Yeah, no, certainly not. And then, but, oh, but the the point was like, these are all one-offs, right? Yeah, right, right, There's right. that one. There's Klingon. And then, yeah. you know, later on, Atlantean for uh, Atlantis. Um, and then, you know, uh, well, not, nothing was really created for the Lord of the Rings movies, per se. They were using Tolkien's languages and expanding them a little mm -hmm. bit. But they did create something for the Hobbit trilogy. But it's like, um, uh, and then, you know, not be for Avatar. There are lots of these one-offs. This was the first time that I was able to actually make a career out of this and job leading a job. I think um, one of the main reasons for that was, uh, well, first, the, the popularity of Game of Thrones. Obviously, if it wasn't sure. popular, that wouldn't have led to anything else. But also that it was a television show and not a movie. Mm. Um, so it needed both of those things. It needed to be, you know, big, huge, popular blockbuster like Avatar. Right. But a television show, which comes back year after year after year after year. Right. Because it's like, you know, a movie comes in as a really big deal for a few months and then it's pretty much, you know, a television show stays in the public consciousness for many years. Right. And so I think that that was what led to this. Um, and then, of course, led to other television shows, which led to other television shows. It does. It It is like a way that the uh, the game of creating stories in a visual format, it has evolved to this point where if you want to be taken at, seriously at the highest level, you have to at least seriously consider creating a language for it. Maybe you get away with not doing it, but it ha because it is so available now, yeah. it seems like that's a real thing. And the thing is, there are thousands of people that do this, mm. you know, for, for fun, that are really, really good at yeah. it. Um, and so there's really, there's really no excuse <laughs> at this stage, unless you just think of it too late and there's not enough time, there's no excuse. I mean, even if you don't want to, even if you don't want to pay top dollar, there are plenty of other language creators who would love a shot right. at it, who will take less. I don't, I don't want to jump into your finances, but in general, give our audience an idea of, of someone who creates languages. Like if you're going to sub out something, what, what's a reasonable expectation for someone who's, you know, skilled up and ready to go? But what do they, what do they make? I have no idea. Um, I mean, it's not really a job. Yeah. Like at this point, like literally I'm the only one that has this job. Okay. So there's one time. of me. Right. Okay. There's one of me. I'm trying, yeah. you know, I'm trying to be able to get work for other language right. creators okay. now. So really it's just, and again, this is brand new. Like right. there's no, there's no real precedent yet. So when you, when you have work, you know, whoever fill in the blank director, Steven Spielberg comes and says, Hey, I want to get this made. And you know, it's more work than you can do. You've yeah. got to scale. You're going to hire someone. So you hire Pete. Mm. And you go, hey, Pete, I can pay you this much to do mm. this work. They're stoked to get the money anyhow yeah. to do the work and everything. Is that is that fair to describe it like that? or? Uh, yeah, but then at the same time, I'm also like paying better. <laughs> yeah. I try to pay better than, yeah, well, what, your people. than what I got. Sure, sure, sure. The The question in terms of like being able to like make a living doing this, it's not it's not even so much a question of the amount of money. It's a question of volume. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Because let's say that, let's say, for example, that you did get like one movie, right? And they, um, and they just went, you know, totally all out and paid you a million dollars to create a language for this movie. It's like, that's really good for right now. Yeah. But then what if you don't get another job after that? Yeah. I mean, you know, a million dollars is a lot of money that'll carry you for some time, but it's, are you going to turn around and say, that's your job? No, yeah. it's like a thing that you did. Right. So it, it's really a question of volume 
and if you can put together consistent work for many years to be able to say that you can do this as a job. The, the nice thing about television is that it's built in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not, it's never a guarantee that a show is going to get picked up for right. you know, multiple seasons. But if it does, you can say like, all right, this is, you know, I can expect this amount of money, you know, getting raises as you go along, yeah. if you do a good job for anywhere from like two to six, maybe seven, you know, if you're lucky, 10 yeah. years. With a, with a movie, like even with Avatar, yeah. there's supposed to be four sequels, but how long has it been, right? right. The, the next one is supposedly coming, or the next two are supposedly yeah. coming, right. but it's like, um, and you know, yeah. for, for somebody like yeah. James Cameron, that's fine. He can, yeah. he can wait as long as he wants to make it perfect, right. but for like, you know, a language creator yeah. working on it? What yeah, are you you're over there doing the ten years in between. Yeah, you're at the Ralphs doing the uh, the night boxing shift, so yeah. you can uh, have freedom to do your language stuff in the daytime. And you're like any day now he's gonna call, you know? Right. Yeah. So, so in order to make this like a realistic job, not only just for myself but for somebody else, mm -hmm. you have to be able to say like, all right, you know, this movie right. is great, but I need to figure out what's gonna happen next year and the year after that and the year after that and the year yeah. after that. Yeah. And if I'm relying on another day job, then I can't really say this is my job. You can't rely on it. Right. How do you, how does, not you, because you already have this set up, but how does the next person or the third person in line set this up on their own then? Like, how do they? This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter. At Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. But how does the next person or the third person in line set this up on their own then? Like, how do they how do they create awareness for this? Because it's easy to make a movie and just do English, you know? Yeah. I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. I really <laughs> don't. And that, of course, is a, a big part of the problem. Uh, because, like, you know, for, for all the work I've done... I've been contacted by over 70 productions since, not even since 2009, since 2011. Wow. Um, gotten a fair amount of those jobs. Uh, a fair amount of them have just, you know, collapsed yeah. due to nobody's fault. Some of them, though, have basically talked to me and been very excited up to the point where I mentioned, especially compared to what I'm making now, a very reasonable amount of money. Yeah. And then I just never heard from them again. Right. And then the show surfaces and they're all speaking English. So it's like that's always a choice they can make if they just don't care. And it's a, it's a very weird thing to be able to, to have to negotiate against because you're not doing that as an actor, right? right? It, it, it's like, it's one thing if you say, oh, we can't afford this actor. We'll, maybe we just won't use actors for this one. You know? Yeah. Maybe it's just not important. Right. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. Cause, yeah. Right. And then actually I want, I don't want to lose this question cause I keep remembering and this is off topic, but I don't want to miss it in game of thrones in any kind of scene where there's a lot of people and they're talking in the background are they speaking valerian are you giving them all like lines that murmur out or yeah yeah okay yeah that's all post uh, adr stuff mm -hmm. it, it's the part i hate doing the most because they want like a huge number of lines and they and they always and it's always a short amount of time like right. you know for the for the script it's like 6 months to translate for ADR, say, oh, we're shooting some ADR tomorrow. We're wondering if you could translate these hundred lines for <laughs> us. I'm like, is yeah. this a joke? It's yeah. because, like, you know, they don't care, yeah. right? Yeah. They don't really care about what people are saying necessarily. Right. And for English, they might literally do that. They'll say to a writer, can we have, like, a hundred or so lines for people to say in the background? And it's, yeah. if, you're, if it's your own language, that's not really a problem. Right. But, so, it's like it's a huge deal. It's a huge but anyway, deal. yes, they uh, they're doing it. Wow. They're, they're doing it. You can ask about uh, Defiance too. That's the one where they created. They had a whole group of ADR artists, and they had a whole Bible that they wow. created based on the material that I gave them. I actually ended up meeting them once at a voiceover recording session for a, a kids movie that I was doing, and they were like, "It's you. You're the one." And I'm like. You were, you were the ones who did that? That was so much fun. <laughs> are you guys, I mean, maybe this is down the road a ways, but are you guys in like the Writers Guild or are you in the Guild at all? Nothing. I've contacted the Writers Guild. I've that contacted seems like the, the Screen the Actors home. Guild. Yeah. I've contacted the Academy for uh, Television. 
I don't care. <laughs> you would think that they want to protect you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Funniest joke of the show. They don't care. They oh, don't care at all. That's at all. Interesting. Yeah, because I mean that's what you do with something like this, right? Is you, I mean, the illustrators, everybody else has some kind of of guild sure. protection. Sure. Yeah. You guys. I am basically a sideshow to them. They yeah. don't care. <laughs> wow. Well, you're a really good sideshow. No, oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so you know how the fans are. They get really into it, and they'll argue about aspects, like super, like, but what's below minutia? You know, like, the stuff where you're like, I never even occurred to me to even occur to that, but I guess this is right. Like, you're almost like the referee in some cases. It, I, I wouldn't say that there's anything that I'm trying... Well, there probably is stuff that's below the level of minutia, but... Nothing that is directly coming to mind, um, but there is stuff where I have had to make conscious choices not to get that detailed uh, because you don't know what the reality of a show or of a scene being filmed is going to be. You, an example was I was listening. Um, you talked about um, Jason Momoa's character saying "throne." In the way he said it, because oh, that one was good. That, yeah, that one was on purpose. And in fact, I recorded him. I recorded just that word to uh-huh. make sure that he said it correctly. Right. Um, but yeah, somebody was trying to come at me saying, "Shouldn't he have said throne?" Because T H R works in Dothraki. And I was like, ah, but not at the beginning of the syllables. Have we reached the point yet with Dothraki or Valerian where someone out there knows more about the language than you and could give you a class? Eh, granted, a high level class, but. Because you know that'll happen at yeah. some point. Someone will have gone past your... They'll take the thing you built and then polished it and made it even bigger and better. Well, probably not more than me. Okay. Uh, or I guess more isn't the way to characterize it. This is, this is, this is the way I say. When you're, when you're creating a language, right, there, um, it's a bit of a fiction that there is a correct way to speak it. Uh, like... Uh, you know, for example, if if I were to just start saying in English, you know, he walked to the store, uh, for instead of he walks to the store, or it's like you know he loved her, most English speakers would say that's that's not right. It should be he walks to the store. It should be he loves her. And sure, but now let's say that you have three or four people that do that. Yeah. And then let's say you have a yeah. thousand people that do that, and then a million people that do that. Well. Right. It's not really incorrect anymore. It's just different, right? And that's that's all you can say. It's different. So when it comes to the languages I create, I certainly am creating them in a very specific way and using them in a very specific way, okay. the way that I imagine. I'm imagining a native speaker, and I'm trying to present it that way. Now, if you have somebody else that's learning that language, and they start using it in a different way, and you know they show it to me, I will definitely be able to say that's an error. But when I say that's an error... What I mean is that's not what I intended, and right. that's not the way that I use the language. That's literally what I must be saying. However, if everybody likes it, yeah. and suddenly they all start doing it, I mean, what can I really say? I can just say, I don't use the language that way, and that's all I can say. Yeah. It's up to them if they want to respect that and use the language in the way that I do, or just use it in the way that they're doing it. And then really the only thing that you can do is just make a note of it. And say, this is how David used Valerian. Right. This is how this fan group used Valerian. And that's it. Is there a circumstance where someone, you know, whoever the character is, let me back out and give you some context first. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons why Sylvester Stallone talks the way like he does is because when he was born, there was some complications in getting him out of the birth canal. And so there were some nerves that were damaged. Mm. And so it causes, you know, I wouldn't say a speech impediment because he speaks fine, but a unique speech pattern. Mm -hmm. So if there is someone like, you know, let's say Rocky spoke a new language, he's from another planet and you wanted to account for that, but everybody else was going to speak in a a more clean fashion. Is that something that you consider or work with an actor on to go, oh, okay. Because, you know, the actor will come up with the background, you know, like I was dropped on my head when I was small. And so I, I, I've lost all my ability to say P or whatever it is. Um, it's something that I could work with an actor on. It's not something that I have done. It's something that I, it's something that I definitely could do if there was interest, both from the actor and either the director or the showrunner to develop like a unique way of speaking a particular language. It's nothing that has occurred. It's something, something like that usually slips below the level of attention Mm, of, of of a showrunner or director. 
uh, or producers, basically the ones that want the language. Um, you know, they understand it up to a point, and then beyond that, it's just invisible. Um, and that's one of the things. So when I have the opportunity mm. to be able to inject things like that, I do. So like on Defiance, I made a conscious effort to make the version of the alien language that was spoken by the adults, the ones who learned it as a first language and learned English as a second language, different from their children who grew up with the alien language in English mm-hmm. bilingually. And in fact, where English was spoken more commonly around them. So their version of the alien language is different. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's nothing that was called for. It's nothing that was in the script. It was just on me and how I translated it. And it was also nothing that was necessarily communicated to the actors. It would be really interesting to be able to do that. Yeah. But um, first of all, somebody has to be aware of that this is an option. Right, right, right. And then everybody needs to be on board. Um, and so far that hasn't happened. I mean, we'll, we'll probably get there. But it's like... A lot of the times I work on a production, it's the first time they've ever worked with anybody creating a language ever. So yeah. a lot of this stuff is just completely new. And, you know, it hasn't had time to percolate. Sure, sure. And, and, and really season into something. Because there are Boomhauers and there are, you know, yep. mumbles from Dick Tracy and those kind of characters where... Yeah. You know, that's the thing. In your native language, yeah. they think about it. Yeah. It's just rarely thought about in non-English languages. Right. But yeah, they, they do. They pay a lot of attention to that stuff when it's English. Yeah. It would be cool to expand that. You know, yeah. A Dothraki stutter or whatever. Yeah. Because all those things would exist, right? Yep. Mm. Yeah. When you look at the things that you want to create in a language, it may, it may not fit that statement of work. Like, it may not be there, but like, I'm dying to write a character that only speaks in the second person. Or forget that, the fourth person. And who even knows what that even is? You know, things like that for you were like, next time I get a chance and it makes sense, I want to really push the artwork this way. Mm. I mean, I always have a bunch of ideas like that. It's rare. It's rare when I get to pull off something interesting. I don't know. You like it? I'm trying to think of a good one. I I know I had one of these. I can't think of it right now. I've I, I've always wanted to do. I will say I've always wanted to do a sign language, and I've gotten to do that with a new project. So that'll mm. be that'll be fun. Uh, you know, to actually do that. I, I it, it's just going to kind of be for um, a very small scene. It would be cool to actually really jump in and do a wholly invented sign language. Mm-hmm. I've always wanted to do that. Never got a chance. And then I've always wanted, you know, one thing I've always wanted to do, I've always wanted to do a, a, a language, a scene, a language lesson scene where it's like people are learning a second language mm-hmm. and are making, you know, realistic mistakes and learning the, the language, learning how to write it. More on writing systems. I want to do that. <laughs> there's stuff. There's always stuff to do. Yeah, that's right. So the, the writing system can be part of it because there's going to be signage and, you know, drink Coke, but in their their language and everything. Is that something you've had to do at all with these? Because I, I don't recall. Okay. Yeah, so I've, I've created writing systems for Defiance, four of them. That was great. Uh, mm-hmm. Defiance, uh, Starcrossed, uh, Bright uh, it was a Netflix one, um, and then a new television show that's coming up that's NDA and uh, Dune, the new movie. Yeah, we're excited about that. Dune is supposed to be really cool. Yeah. Uh, also for a video game I did, hmm. Arena of Valor. So I, I've gotten to do it. But the one place I didn't get to do it was Game of Thrones, where the High Valyrian language is supposed to have a very unique writing system. Mm-hmm. And I always wanted to do that, and they never... That was For them, that was, that was too far. It's like, we'll do this, 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 and this, but that, no, too much. Too we're, much. We're just going to write Kill the Masters in English on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Marine. God, that is so bad. Yeah. But it does. Uh, yeah, you're right. It, it's like in a movie when they say, do you speak basic? <laughs> you're like, oh, man. And they, cause that, that must break your heart when you hear that. Yeah. You know, they, especially even when, even for the shows that I've created languages for, there are always places where I say, I don't think they should be speaking English here. Mm-hmm. But they're still doing it. it, it it's never a hundred percent. It's never a hundred percent. But you know, little victories. Yeah, I mean, look where you guys are now. I mean, ten years ago, mm-hmm. there was this really wasn't an industry per se. It was, yep, possibly available. What was the break? Oh, for for Game of Thrones, it was a competition. Uh, it was a competition that went through the Language Creation Society. So uh, the uh, uh, HBO 
uh, contracted with the Language Creation Society, who was then running a competition, and then they were going to subcontract to the winner of that competition. But I mean, how do they even know you guys exist? At the time, so this is around March, um, there was a book that had been published by Erica Okrent called mm. uh, In the Land of Invented Languages. And it got a little bit of press, like, you know, in newspapers and things right. like that. And so they, uh, the producers of Game of Thrones, they saw one of these articles and contacted her, the author of this book, who then put them in contact with the Language Creation right. Society. Yeah. She had done that because she knew about us because she went to our second language creation conference oh, okay. when she, uh, two years prior when she was doing research for her book. And so uh, that's how that all happened. But I mean, like that random string of things happens. You know, you guys yeah. put out the right thing on Facebook at the right time to say we're going to meet at the Hilton and boom. Yeah. The nice thing, though, was that at, uh, at the end, once it, once it actually came to fruition, it was still a competition. So it was announced to language creators all over the world. Yeah. Anybody could apply. Anybody could compete. Um, it was kind of a bad, a poorly designed competition, but it was a competition nonetheless. Everybody had a shot. And so, you know, I won it, um, but everybody had a shot. Did you have a sense that you would win it? Like, do you have like a pecking order and you're one of the, the king language creators or something? Or um, I, The way I would put it is at that time, I was in a group of, say, I don't know, 60 to 100 language creators mm -hmm. that I thought uh, were capable of really high quality work. Not all of them applied, not even close. Only... Uh, I would say of the 40, maybe about 20 were in that group. Oh, wow. Okay. There were, there were definitely some people applied who probably had no business applying, but, you know, they tried. Basically, when I won the competition, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't a foregone conclusion, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, you know, out of nowhere. Like, right. you know, who is this person? It was, you know, I was, I was respected well enough that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't crazy that I won the competition. That said, there were many other people for whom that was also true, or that who that would have been also true. Hmm. What stood out about your work? I mean, obviously you guys are peers, so that the work is common. But oh, I had a very, very specific plan. Okay. And how I was going to uh, apply for this job, based on the nature of the competition, which was there was absolutely no upper limit on the amount of material that you could provide. None. So, I mean, that was a huge mistake. Uh, and also, part of the application process was to translate everything for the pilot, which was literally the entirety of the work that mm -hmm. they wanted. So, basically, you were applying for the job by wow. doing the yeah. actual job. And then only one person was going to get paid. And then everybody else could never use their work again because all of the application materials are owned by HBO. And they didn't want them to be released, of course, because they didn't want to, people saying, well, this was my Dothraki. They wanted yeah. to say there was only one of them. So um, that's something that should have never happened. I mean, it's not how you apply for a job. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah, because that is their stuff. Or you get to pay them for their stuff. Uh, you know, if, yeah. you, if you're going to buy it and throw it away, that's one thing. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's, that's and so anyway, so it's like, yeah, so only the winner was ever going to be paid or mm -hmm. compensated for right. doing this actual work. Right. Which was ridiculous. Um, and so anyway, when I saw that the nature that that was the nature of this competition, which basically the moment I saw what the <laughs> requirements were for this, I was like, oh, my God, I, I saw what the next month and a half of my life was going to be like. Yeah. I said, I need to do I need to do three things. One, I need to produce the best quality work I've ever produced. And then I need to produce more material than anybody else ridiculously right. more than material like yeah. more than twice as much as anybody else um and then i need to uh basically uh make this all of this hugely dense very linguistically complex material um i need to have something in there that makes it appeal to somebody that knows nothing about language and so that was the goal so like in a month and a half, I produced over 300 pages of material. Jesus. Um, wow. Nobody else who applied was anywhere close to that. I don't think anybody else even scratched You were a novel, 100. basically. Yeah. In Dothraki or, or whatever language they had you write it in. You know, and then, of course, like I did the best work I could. 
uh, in that time. And then I, you know, I had the recording. So they were, they were always going to have the recordings, which is mm-hmm. for, for them, it's purely subjective. But, you know, I thought it sounded pretty good and close to what George R. R. Martin wanted. And then after that, I wrote up a single page that I called Dothraki Fun Facts that just had a bunch of facts or non-facts in there about the language that I figured people who didn't know anything about language would find interesting. Mm -hmm. Like one of these facts was that the Dothraki have no word for sin or shame, which was true because I just hadn't created them. (laughs) You see? So it was just garbage like that. Yeah. And it was a single page, you know, double spaced, big font. Yeah. You know? And so I wanted to give them that one page and then the 300 pages behind it where they would just look at it and say, I can't even make heads or tails out of this. It looks about right. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, to, you know, actually, <laughs> you know, honor the fact that we were coming from the language creation community. This is what we did. Yeah. You know, I just, I mean, there's no other word for it. I just busted my ass for a month and a half and did it the best I possibly could. Had you read the books prior to the uh, RFP? No, there was, and there was going to be no time to do that in a month wow. and a half. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Um, my wife had them, and so she went through and highlighted all the Daenerys chapters for me so I could look at them yeah. for reference. That was good. And I and we all had a list of every single word and name that were used in the books. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of us had that to work from. So that was, you know, that was extremely helpful as well. Um, but yeah, I wasn't able to read the books. Uh, I read them later. I read yeah. them now. Are you, would you have changed how you structured anything now that you've read the books? Um, no. There are things I would have done differently had it not been for a TV show, um, which is like, you know, I might have uh, gotten rid of a single word for horse and just only used uh, different words based on the horse age, gender and coloring Mm -hmm. so that there wasn't any equivalent to a word like horse. You'd have to say, well, what type do you mean? Mm -hmm. Um, I did that because there was no chance you'd ever know what type of a horse is going to be on the screen. Like, yeah, yeah. So I knew there had to be a basic word. But you're right, though. Those things exist. Like in Arabic, you know, when you get your nickname, because everybody's named Mohammed for the most part, you know, so it's like, no, it's, that's Abu, Abu Muhammad or, you know, the guy with glasses, Muhammad. You know, they have all these ways of describing something that's, you have to have more words, you know, to describe something that's quite common. Well, in this case, those words exist in Dothraki. Uh-huh. I'm just saying there shouldn't be a basic one. Got you. Right. Uh, I don't think it should exist. And uh, I might have made similar choices down the line. You know, like with a word for tree, I might not have done that either. And there are also things that I did because uh, I anticipated that there would be, you know, a lot of fans wanting to learn the language. So there are certain places where I went against my uh, some of my ideas, some of my irregular ideas, and regularized them a little bit. I certainly would have, I, I, I wouldn't have done that had I known that there would have been, because there wasn't at the beginning, almost no reaction to the language at all, and certainly not a fan community. Um, so I wouldn't have done that. Um, and then uh, I might have put a duel in the language. Um, it's really hard to have a duel in a language if you don't know if there's going to be exactly two of somebody or not. Right. Right. You know, sight unseen. So... I, I left that out on purpose. Um, might have thrown that in there. I don't know. A couple of other things, maybe. Yeah. Those are those are great things to think of too. Even like in English, like if I said, "There's gunmen in the room," you have no idea how many people are in the room. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just really hard. When you come, and I, I know we're almost out of time, so I just want to come through with this last question. When you look at how you design language and your peers design language, you've got two degrees in linguistics, one's an advanced degree. You've got a real pedigree for how language works. And so I'm assuming that makes you a little more on that end of the scope. But what about the folks that are more artistic and they come up with things and you're like, how in the world did you ever get to that? You know, are there, is, is what's the spectrum for you guys? And then who do you see out there and go, God, I wish I could do it like that, but that's just their style. There are, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, basically, when I'm looking at other other created languages, there are always things that I look for and things that surprise me, things that I find very interesting. Something that's very difficult to do is to create something, especially a bit of grammar, that doesn't exist in a way that it makes sense that it could have evolved in the way that the interrelationships of the systematicity makes sense. I'd like to think that I've done that a couple of times. A very good friend of mine, Sylvia Sotomayor, she's... Um, honestly, probably the best living language creator on the planet. And she is, uh, in a recent language, she's created a system where I saw that system, and I said, that makes perfect sense, and I see how you evolved it. And I 
can't say for certain if it ever has existed in any language on the planet, but there's no reason why it couldn't, and it's completely unique. That's something that um, is very, very difficult to do. She has a, a system where you, you probably, if you've looked at German, you know cases, things like yeah. nominative, accusative, and everything like that. Lots of languages have those. Her case system is entirely based on motion, hmm. whether uh, a body is in motion or not, and then the relationships uh, of that motion to other things. So every single, um, every single argument, whether something's a subject of the sentence or the object of the sentence, all of that is related to motion. Hmm. And the way that she laid it out and demonstrated it makes so much sense it just you you honestly question why it hasn't happened before or or maybe it has happened before and the system has just been regularized to this point or yeah. or reanalyzed or um, wiped out yeah for that matter yeah and so it, something like that is where i look at that and say that is that is so brilliant that i wish i would have come up with it i wish i could have thought of it i don't know how i would ever would have yeah something like that um and yeah, I see, I, I see things like that in other people's languages all the time. And it's always fun to come across something like that. Yeah, that's neat, man. Well, I, listen, I appreciate you doing this with us. Cause yeah, that's, sure. I, it was a, it's a fascinating conversation, and I just I, I dig it that you took time to do it. And I want to have more of this, so next time you have a project you can talk about, let's, uh, let's dig in, if you don't mind. Yeah, right on. Love to.